Most newer Unity developers don't really spend a lot of time improving their own workflow. They're just focused on making their game. Creating custom inspectors, property drawers, and editors can vastly improve your workflow and the workflow of your team. In this video, we're going to take a look at what we've done so far in the Gun Scriptable Object series and see what we can do to improve that workflow because right now it's really clunky. Hey, Chris here from Mom Academy, here to help you. Who? Me? Yes, you. Make your game dev dreams become reality by helping you improve your workflow with custom editors. Really quick, just in case you haven't been following along with the gun series, what we've done there is created a gun scriptable object and then several other scriptable objects like an ammo config, shoot config, trail config, damage config, and audio config. And all of those other configs are other scriptable objects that we reference from the main gun scriptable object. That way we don't just have one huge triple object that does everything. We've kind of abstracted some of the configurations and functionality out to everything to do with shooting is handled in one configuration, everything about audio is handled in one configuration, et cetera, et cetera. However, if we're going to start creating guns and we're going to have, I don't know, 50 guns in our game, that leaves the potential for 50 gun scriptal objects to need to be created. And each of those potentially could have five additional scriptable objects if we're not reusing any for whatever reason. So the workflow of managing that is extremely tedious. I have to go to asset create guns, gun scriptable object, asset guns create shoot config, asset guns create audio config, etc. for each scriptable object. And that just is a really a lot of clicking to get one gun set up. And there's going to be more in the future. So even more clicking. So it'd be really convenient if from the gun scriptable object, I could just immediately create those other scriptable objects needed. Pretty recently, Unity's released a new UI system called the UI Toolkit, which is a new cool way for us to manage our user interfaces using more web-based looking approach. Today, we're gonna be specifically looking at the editor version of this so we can create new editors, inspectors, that kind of stuff. But there's also a runtime component that we're just not gonna to touch on today, but it works very similar to the editor one we're doing. I've created a property drawer for our shoot config scriptable object. I wanna show you how we can create property drawers from code in the same kind of workflow that you're used to if you've made an I am GUI editor thing before. This way, has a lot of code because you're defining each element in code, configuring it in code, adding it to a container, and then rendering it. And then you also have whatever click handlers and that kind of stuff. So if you've done I am GUI before, this should be very familiar. If you've never done that before, don't be scared by the amount of code because we're also going to, in a future video, look at how we can do UXML to define how the user interface should look with some XML template that comes with a UI builder where we can drag and drop different controls. Neither one of these approaches is right or wrong. It's really which one are you more comfortable with? You can do everything you can do with one of them and the other. Now, a really important note, starting in Unity 2022, the UI toolkit is going to be the default way that we build UIs in editor for the editor instead of using the I am GUI. I'm using Unity 2021 in this video. So I've mentioned a couple of things like a property drawer, custom inspector, this kind of stuff, which maybe you're not very familiar with. So let's talk about what is a property drawer. This is a C sharp class that we define that will allow us to customize whenever we use a property field in the inspector, how it will render that content. So for example, a property drawer for an enum will be a dropdown that will show us the values of that enumeration and we can select one of them. The property drawer for a string will have us that label and then just a text field that we can input data for. When we start getting to more complex controls like maybe we want a prefab or even another script, usually the only thing that we get in the inspector by default is we drag a reference to that thing. And that works pretty well in a lot of cases. But when we start getting to some situations like this, where we have several different external configurations and we want to modify them, it becomes very cumbersome to go back and forth between this object, that object, the other object to make sure that the configuration looks right. It becomes very convenient if we can just modify all of that in the same control. So that's where we get the property drawer. We can define a custom property drawer for a particular type. And because this is an editor script, we have to make sure that this class that we create is in an editor folder. This is a special folder name where we must put all of our editor scripts. They will be excluded from the full project build, but they will work in the editor. This allows us to safely reference some namespaces like Unity Editor and things like the custom property drawer, the property drawer, and that kind of stuff. Not every control needs a property drawer, so you can choose when you want to define one versus when you want to use the defaults. The default controls we get are labels, buttons, toggles, 
fold outs, min max sliders, sliders, progress bars, drop downs, radio buttons, radio button groups, integer float, long, and text fields. And of course, your standard things like bounds, vector three, vector twos, vector fours, colors, curves, and gradients, enums, tags, masks, layers, and layer masks. If you've ever defined any field and seen that in the inspector before, you should be familiar with all of those already. What we're going to look at is how to implement a property drawer that will allow us to modify the configuration of one of those reference other objects directly here in the same inspector. So we have a custom inspector for our gun scriptable object that does a little bit of styling, and we have a property drawer for our shoot config scriptable object that will draw some custom controls based on the current value of that shoot configuration. So the property drawer allows us to customize how we will render all the fields for that particular property instead of just getting the default inspector look and feel. Whenever you're defining a property drawer, the first thing you need to do is first make sure it's in an editor folder, then make it extend the property drawer class. Attach an attribute to the class that says custom property drawer type of and then the type you want it to be the custom property drawer for, and optionally say that it should also apply to child objects. If we're going to define this strictly in code, which is the workflow we're going to look at today, you do not need to use any UXML. You just need to have some kind of styles, and those styles should all be available wherever this is going to be drawn. You'll define a public override void, visual element, create property GUI that accepts a serialized property. That's the serialized property that we're going to be drawing for. Create a new visual element, They're the base element that all the other types of things like our buttons, toggles, all that kind of stuff derives from. The way I use them is if I need a container, I make just a visual element. I'm adding a classless panel just so it gets some styling. That's not super important here. And then I return build UI, which accepts that inspector, the root element that we just created and the serialized property. You can see that we have this cool expand collapse control, which we're doing by creating a visual element, having it display things horizontally. That's just using flex direction row, creating a caret label that just has this little triangle, setting it to be a little bit larger because it's kind of small, and adding a class that's either going to have it rotate zero degrees or rotate 90 degrees. So it gets this little rotation that we see in an animated fashion. I don't want to go too much into how USS works because it's very incredibly similar to CSS and there's an incredible amount of documentation on CSS. I'll include some links in the description to some of the key stuff that we're going to talk about. We just add that caret and then the title to the title container and then we add a click event handler to the title container. So if we click anywhere there, it should call this handle title click. All we're doing on title click is messing with the classes here, which we're basically showing and hiding the content panels below by calling them expanded or collapsed. And we're toggling this internal state of is expanded after we make that click. And of course, we're adding stuff to the root element so we can actually see it because the root element that we created is what's going to actually be rendered whenever we draw the property drawer. Then I'm checking what is the value of the shoot configuration? Is it a null value? If so, I want to show something totally different than the properties of the shoot config because if there's a null value, I can't show the rest of the configuration because there's not a shoot configuration to show the configuration for. So what I have going on in the build no shoot panel is basically just building this UI. It's pretty simple. It just has some labels, an input field, and a create button, and then an option to select an existing one. We can take a look at that creation. This isn't UI toolkit specific, but something cool that you can do is you can create a new scriptable object and then use asset database.create asset, passing in that object and then the path you want to create it at, and that'll create it for you. I'm then assigning that value to be the object reference value and updating the serialized object. That triggers a re-render of this. And I'll get into how that re-render happens because it's a little bit funky. With IAM GUI, if you've used that before, you get a lot of updates in a loop. Over here, they have retained mode kind of set up. So they don't, every frame or every mouse move or anything like that, they don't re-render the whole thing. They keep it kind of static until there's something important to react to. Not a lot else going on here, except we're having this build object field, which is where we see that shoot config and then the object field where we can choose which one we want to see. So an object field is a type of field where we want to actually reference a game object or a material or it's basically anything that's not a text, boolean, or number, or enum. We use an object field for those. You define it like this, where we tell it what object type it should accept. 
and we bind it to the property. And we want this to be bound to the shoot config. So we're doing property and finding whatever serialized object this belongs to, which is gonna be a gun scriptable object. And we're finding this shoot config property. And we're binding this object field to the shoot config, which sounds a little bit weird because we're doing a property drawer for the shoot config, but we're also allowing you to select a shoot config for that selection. Normally, like the gun scriptable object would have an object field that would show a shoot config selection. So this is how we can show an object field for the current property that we're trying to show. And here's how we handle the redraw. We get the current value of the property and we have to do that outside of the next line, which is register value changed callback because that change event gets raised after the change. And we end up getting some like infinite looping if we don't handle it this way. This might seem a little hacky because you might just think, well, we'll just compare to change event dot previous value, which I tried and it just didn't quite work right. I had to do it this way. So if you know why the previous value doesn't work, go ahead and let me know in the comments so I can learn something from you. So if we've changed values, then we want to handle the change of shoot config. And what we're doing there is clearing all the root elements and rebuilding the UI for that root element, which again, probably sounds pretty weird. But if you remember that we're talking about this UI is built in a retained mode, the create property GUI doesn't get called again after we change the property. It's just there. So we would have had to try to build the entire UI in the first pass and hide everything, but we can't really do that because we want to bind properties of this property and this property was potentially null. Let's take a look at build shoot config box, which is what happens when we actually have a shoot config assigned. So remember that looks like this. At the top, we have that exact same shoot config object field, and we have a delete button, which would actually delete that shoot config in case maybe we don't want that one anymore. Then because these are scriptable objects, we need to create a new serialized object based on the current value of this serialized property. So we're trying to create a new serialized object in our property drawer, and the serialized object should be this shoot config scriptable object. Scriptable objects work a little bit weird because they won't let you just do find property relative or find property. You always get a null result there. So we're adding some labels, and then here's where you can really see how do you build your own custom inspector using code. We define the enum fields, object fields, toggles, all these kinds of things. We do bind property, taking from that shoot config serialized object that we just created and we find the properties from that serialized object. Doing this bind property makes it so we automatically get things like undo. If you assign something wrong or you click something wrong, it just automatically will give you the ability to press control Z and undo that change. I highly recommend you use bind property unless you have a really good use case not to use it. If we take a look at is hit scan gun, which is a toggle, we'll notice that we see different fields based on if that's true or false. So how you hide elements or don't show elements or show different elements based on some condition, in this case, like is hit scan gun if it's true. I don't want the user to have to assign a bullet prefab. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't even make sense to see because a hit scan gun does not use a bullet prefab. It just moves a bullet trail. So if we set it to false, we can see the bullet prefab. We keep it as true, it goes away. So we can register a value changed callback on the is hit scan toggle to add or remove the hidden class from the bullet prefab. But you'll notice that we define the bullet prefab already and we always add both of these in the correct order to our parent container. And we're just toggling whether we can or can't see this particular object. That goes back to, we have the retained mode, so we're not getting a bunch of re-renders and recreating all these objects all the time. Adding and removing classes does make it re-render. So if we remove the hidden class, then it knows to do some update and we can then see the bullet prefab field. So you can apply this pattern anytime you have conditional logic to whether I need to show something or don't need to show something, make sure that that thing exists and then toggle the visibility of it. You can see more pretty standard things like hit masks, sliders, float fields, all of these. I think are pretty straightforward. We're doing the exact same thing we've been doing this whole time, just binding a property to them, possibly assigning ranges to the sliders. You can see that we have enum fields, layer masks, sliders, float fields, and we can define some other cool stuff to give ourselves some hints. We can use something called the help box, which allows us to put in information warning or error messages. So if you need like some field is required, you can add in a error help box if it's set to be null and show or hide that just like we did the bullet prefab based on if that value is null or not. And you can see that we're doing a very similar thing, hiding and showing fields, including that help box based on whether we have a simple none or texture based spread. Each of these enums uses different fields and it doesn't make sense to display the other ones when they're not being used. So for a texture based spread, we need to provide a texture and a multiplier. For simple, we just want a vector three field and for none, we don't want any of those. So it's not important to show any of them. We're doing the exact same thing of just adding and removing the hidden class. If you've never written an editor before, 
you're probably like, wow, this is a lot of code. And I agree. You have to write a lot of code to get the editor to work because you're building all the elements, adding in the container, styling them, whatever. It's actually less code than what we had to do with I am GUI because we had to kind of define all those styles in code somewhere else. With UI Toolkit and USS, it actually kind of moves a lot of that styling code out and gives us all the benefits that we can get with CSS. And I would be remiss to say that there are some paid assets that do a lot of this kind of stuff for you. The wildly popular Odin Inspector is almost wildly popular and gives you a lot of controls out of the box where you don't have to write your own custom editors. You just add tags, like, ser like how you do serialize field and range and that kind of stuff in your mono behavior and it reads those and then draws the editor for you. If you do have the budget for it, that may be something that you can use to really reduce the amount of time you have to write your own custom editors. But if you're making something that you want to put on the asset store, then this is the kind of thing that you need to do. As I said earlier, in the next couple of videos on the UI toolkit, we're gonna look at how we can use UXML in conjunction with these scripts, and also how we're gonna make some reusable components in UI Toolkit to simplify this workflow. Because right now, if we wanted to extend this property drawer that we made on the shoot config, we need to do a lot of copy paste code to support the damage, trail config, all the other configs basically, to get that same interaction. So what we'll do in those videos is create a custom control that will manage the name input, the selection of a scriptable object, and the expand collapse stuff that we have. And the property drawer would use that and then just add its own components below whenever you're actually drawing the inspector. If you wanna see more videos like this and those videos I just mentioned, go ahead and like and subscribe to help the channel grow, reach more people and add value to more people. New videos posted every tutorial Tuesday. And if you wanna support this channel, you can go to patreon.com slash academy or just click join right here on YouTube. Get your name up here on the screen, get a shout out starting at the awesome tier and some other cool perks. At the awesome tier, there's Gerald Anderson, Autumn K, Matt Parkin, Ivan, Rulin, and Ify Obelis. And at the tremendous tier, there's Bruno Bozic. And at the phenomenal tier, there's Andrew Bowen. Thank you all for your support. I am so incredibly grateful.